welcome everyone to uh, September 28th City Council work session. Uh, the first item up is committee reports and items of interest. And I'm looking around the table for somebody who's ready to go on this. You? Yes. Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, a few things. First one is uh, LCOG held their regular meeting last week. And um, the, everything is proceeding much uh, more uh, clearly and effectively with LCOG than it has been in the past. They're in the middle of their um, contract negotiations, and so they're working on that, but everything seems to be moving along. Um, and related to that, I was appointed as the LCOG representative to the Cascades West Economic Development uh, Group, and they had their meeting also last week in uh, Newport, and uh, they reported on the various activities that are going on around economic development and workforce development, and it was a good meeting. Um, actually, the one before that, they had talked a lot about um, organizational and business resiliency uh, after uh, a major event like an earthquake or a flood or a, a tsunami and how you have the imme immediate emergency and then you have all the need after that to respond. Um, also, um, I met with the Home Evaluation Committee. That is a subset of the Housing Policy Board that reviews applications for HUD funds. And the one that is in the pipeline right now is the St. Vincent de Paul application for uh, the church in South Eugene that they want to turn into um, a runaway teen housing. Great project. They received very high scores, and that will go through um, the governance committee, which is made up of the mayors and uh, two councilors. Uh, and then if that's approved, which I suspect it probably will, then it will come to us. Or actually, it will come to us, and then it will go to the governance committee. So you should be seeing that very soon. Um, also, the Human Rights Commission met uh, last week and talked about the um, resolution that we just passed um, on Monday night. Um, I think they were very pleased with the results of that and they're also um, creating their strategic plan. So there will be a visit relatively soon uh, with the Human Rights Commission and the City Council to talk about their strategic plan and their goals and objectives for the coming year. Um, also, um, Greg couldn't make it and Claire is out, so I was asked if I could um, substitute at the uh, Human Services Commission meeting, and they're in the process of getting ready to start um, working on their uh, budgeting. And so uh, uh, it, they also talk a lot at Human Services Commission about their interface and interaction with the Poverty and Homelessness mm -hmm. Commission. And so I'm real pleased at the efforts to try to connect the dots and keep everybody um, on the same page so that we don't duplicate any efforts. Um, the Enterprise Zone Task Force um, has also had its first meeting. Uh, we did a great job of going through the previous Enterprise Zone Task Force um, uh, recommendations and conditions and criteria. We did have some absolute fine tuning we want to do, and so maybe um, George can fill in a little bit more about it. But uh, we'll be meeting a couple more times, and uh, we'll be collecting information in order to make, I think, some really good updates and, and corrections to that. Um, and finally, the v Vietnam Memorial will be um, uh, in uh, Skinner Butte Park uh, tomorrow morning. There will be a ceremony, and uh, I will be there, and the mayor will be there, and, and John John's will be speaking. there. And, John's speaking. And John is speaking as a veteran. So I mm -hmm. uh, hope everybody can come to that. Mm -hmm. Eddie, you have anything? Uh, thank you, P.S. Um, not much, but I'll wrap a board, Matt, and decided to reduce the fine for a contractor who was burning asbestos. It was a split vote. I was in the minority. But, um, and if, in my neighborhood, the big deal now, or one big deal, is um, the proposal to build multi-unit housing at 32nd and Hilliard, where there was a church. And I think it's a good idea, which I said too soon, maybe, I mean, too publicly or something. But I do think it's a good idea, but I do hope they will respect the the privacy of the three homeowners directly abutting that place. And they are concerned about sunlight and about well, noise, I guess, but... Um, and how tall it will be and how close to their properties. And I hope that there's some way we can control that or, or talk to the developer about respecting and talking to the homeowners behind behind there. Otherwise, it looks like an excellent spot because it's between Albertsons and a medical clinic and, and on the bus line and by the park and everything. But, um, but I think we do need to consider, even if it was just one person, we need to consider their their needs. Thank you. 
Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I met recently with uh, the general manager of Delta Sand and Gravel and with a number of folks from the Santa Clara community organization. There's a, they're doing a, a good deal of advance work together, which I thought was pretty cool. And there's a, a project slated for an extension of the bike path that goes up through um, that northern part near the river that is planned and so they're doing a good deal of work in advance together to make sure that uh, uh, it's actually Delta Sand really wants to give, give part of their property in order to make that um, continuation of the path work really well for the neighbors up there and I thought it was a, a nice change of story mm -hmm. from things we've heard previously with you know different uh, interactions and 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 uh, issues that have developed in the years between them and the neighbors in the near area. So I thought it was it was pretty cool that they're working pretty hard to do well and to uh, to, to improve relations with those neighbors and to to do some things for them, um, and that will help the city as well. So that's why they invited me. Uh, George and I continue to work with the uh, folks from his ward and from the Northeast neighbors, and I appreciate, John, I think that you probably got the application already, uh, I believe, from Northeast neighbors and the developer for their their plan to make use of our <clears throat> motion that we passed about SDC credits in order to start the development of, uh, of Stryker Park up there. So we'll look forward to engaging in that process as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I don't have much to report. Uh, the McKenzie Watershed Council will be will be having our all-day retreat tomorrow at UWEP where we go over what's been accomplished and how you know many goals that we met and um, and then you know plans for the future. So I'll have more to report next time. George. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to Chris's comments about the uh, enterprise zone. It's it's uh, kind of a fast-paced meeting, and I think we will come up with some pretty good suggestions. Um, <clears throat> see, the um, EMX Steering Committee was meeting next month, so I don't have anything to report on it since our last meeting. Uh, the Lane Workforce Partnership, uh, Christine Payne broke her ankle, so we had to cancel our meeting last time, so I don't have anything to report on that. Travel Lane County board meeting is tomorrow. <laughs> However, um, um, Kerry Westland did uh, come yesterday and did the annual report to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, it's on the web, so if you want to look at it, there's some really, really good, interesting information and some videos on it. But in, in, in general, it's uh, Travel Lane County is not solely responsible, but has assisted in bringing thousands and thousands of visitors to Lane County and millions and millions of dollars in the local income. It's a, it's a great organization. They do a lot of good work, and we're very fortunate to have Kerry Westland as the CEO of that, that organization. Uh, one of the county commissioners commented about um, the fact that he has had contact with some people that are kind of disappointed that, uh, you know, they do a lot of traveling all over the place, and they've always had access to Uber. And he was kind of questioning why we don't have it here. <clears throat> I was in the back of the room, wasn't able to respond. I did get a hold of Sarah Maderi and asked her to get, get me an update on where we are on that process so I can get it to the Board of Commissioners so they know. And I think that was, that was it. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank uh, Council <clears throat> Pryor for substituting for me at the HSC meeting and also Councilor Surrett. Um, I had to work, <laughs> so <laughs> there's certain priorities I have to have to attend to. So um, the other thing is is that uh, both Councilor Taylor and I will be attending the LOC meeting in Salem uh, starting tomorrow, th Friday and Saturday. Um, and uh, I was contacted by uh, members of the Whitaker Community Council uh, after uh, uh, Mayor Piercy's meeting with them regarding the public safety issues that they're facing over there. So I um, then uh, contacted um, Chief Kearns. He and I are gonna be meeting 
next week, uh, kind of to discuss and you know some of the, the the things that were discussed in that meeting, and to develop a follow up session with them to kind of begin to work through some of the issues and strategies that um, may be employed to deal with um, some of the concerns that they have around um, some of the public safety challenges they've been having as of late. So um, I plan to talk to the mayor some more about that and uh, to get other perspectives in, in, in the, the course of um, dealing with those issues. So. Um, that's my report. So uh, to follow up on this, what I was going to say is I know the uh, city manager and staff are having their first meeting with Sam Hahn, who heads up the Whitaker Neighborhood Association, to address those very issues, that have, uh, and that and many other issues that have been brought up. Well, we actually met yesterday. Oh, you did? Mm, as a first. So I think I just want to be sure you are. Mm. You are uh, and he mentioned uh, the follow-up that uh, you and Pete will be having with them next week. So. Okay. Just keeping those things um, coordinated with each other, I think, would be helpful. Yes. Um, Monday, uh, Chris and I attended a <clears throat> VIP tour of Whole Foods before it opened, and their grand opening was this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I figured there were going to be a lot of people there, so I didn't, I didn't go, but I know, Mayor Piercy, you're doing the ribbon cutting. Yep. Uh, I would just like to welcome them to our community. Uh, my wife and I, um, she was going to meet some friends today for lunch there, so we decided to, you know, reduce our carbon footprint, so we rode in together in our hybrid car, and it's a good thing we didn't take two cars because there's no parking in their parking lot at a quarter to 11 this morning. So uh, it's uh, getting off to a good start, and again, welcome to the community. And they had a great ceremony this morning and a lot of uh, local um, I guess a piece that I would put up, up about that is uh, they've done a lot of work with local farms and local uh, production to have it in their facility, and a lot of those folks were there. And I just was what well, part of my comments today were sort of connect that to our food and beverage cluster and the work that we're trying to do for economic development. So I think it was really a, a good illustration of how that's starting to continue to grow in our area. Yes. Mayor, one last thing. I, I did have the opportunity to attend the ribbon cut, cutting ceremony for Howard Elementary School over in the River Road area, uh, kind of substituting for Claire there. Um, and uh, just, just as an aside, my wife went to River Road, my stepson went to River Road, <laughs> I'm at River Road, but Howard, I'm saying River Road, River Road's another school, so forgive me for that. My wife went to Howard, my stepson went to Howard, and, and all of my wife's sisters went to Howard. So uh, there's kind of a deep connection there with Howard Elementary School. Great edifice, good looking, you know, oh, nice building. Place. And uh, my boys went to Roosevelt, so I'd be anxious to see how Roosevelt has turned out, the new Roosevelt. Add yeah. to that, I, I wasn't at the ribbon cutting for Howard, but I went over for the open for the open house. It's a terrific facility. And then I went yesterday to the ribbon cutting for Roosevelt, another terrific facility. And I guess the thing I would like to point out is the work that they've done on those snow build those buildings really move along the work we're trying to do with our CRO. They are, have really worked hard on it being not only teaching about um, uh, energy efficiency and good uh, practices, but also it, uh, employing it in their in their building and in their facility and it's going to save them a lot of resources and a lot of them and it's also going to do help us move what we need to be moving in our community so i think it's just it's a terrific uh win-win yeah, yeah yeah yes i was there too and i i was really impressed by their use of natural light mm -hmm. which reminds me of this dark spot over here that mm -hmm. we should open and i will say it and i know many people have warm warm feelings about the old Roosevelt and so forth because you do because it's been around for a long time. Long time. Where, um, my kids went there so forth, you know, but um, but I will say in the new building In both of those buildings the amount of light that comes in and the can and the uh, enclosed um, uh, Space for kids to be outside and be safe. I mean, it's really a, a wonderful uh, step well forward. Designed. Well designed. Okay couple other things um I welcomed all the foreign students to Eugene for the for U of O. 
celebrated the Eugene Opera, which is a wonderful organization's 40th anniversary with them. Um, test drives an electric vehicle. Um, the Leaf. Yeah, Leaf. And um, uh, participated in interfaith dialogue on homelessness, which we had about, I don't know what they say, 45 congregations came to see what they could learn from each other and do together to, to move that along, went to the RAIN strategic planning retreat since uh, there's a mayor's position on that board, went to the, uh, let's see, this, uh, that's a grand opening, um, oh, and Ala Plaza had their grand opening yesterday, so, and the work that's been done on that is really great as well, so there's a lot of progress in a lot of places, and um, makes you feel good when you see that. Good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. You need, right. you need something to do. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I think we have the great Willamette cleanup is this Saturday. Yeah. This Saturday right? 7.30. Yep. And so everybody's invited to participate in, in that as we really, that's part of the work, again, that we do to try to clean up with up after some of these difficult situations we have with people living along our mm -hmm. our riverbanks so it's a really important uh, piece of work and i know councillor clark participates in it every yeah. every year all right let's go on to our next item on the agenda oh city manager you have anything wanted you wanted to no, add ma nothing to add. okay this is a work session on the zone of benefit <laughs> mark okay <laughs> So I want to be in that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I might have to work on the name. <laughs> so, uh, Mayor Pearson, members of the council. Um, so the purpose of this, this work session is to provide an overview of two proposed changes or amendments to Chapter 7 of the Eugene Code that are related to privately engineered public improvements that serve new development. And Chapter 7 is titled Public Improvements and provides the regulatory framework for the construction of public improvements for city-initiated projects through our capital improvement program, including assessment projects, and also for privately engineered public improvements that are required uh, of new development. So the first uh, proposed amendment um, would create a new section of code allowing for the establishment of a zone of benefit or reimbursement district for privately engineered public improvements that provide capacity in excess of that needed by the development funding the improvement. So currently the Eugene Code allows a developer that provides capacity beyond what is needed for his development or her development, um, uh, the opportunity to, to receive an SDC credit for that excess capacity. Um, but this, this new section of code would address two issues. One is in some developments that um, credit they receive for the excess capacity uh, exceeds the amount of SDCs they paid. So they may get a credit for $200,000, but they've only actually paid $100,000 in SDCs for that particular system. So they get reimbursed that 100000 that they paid, and then the other is a credit that there's really no opportunity for them to recover that additional expense um, that other properties will benefit from. And then the second example is some improvements, um, for example, an eight inch wastewater line is the minimum size. And so if a developer builds an eight inch wastewater line, they don't get any credit because that's the minimum size required. But sometimes that develop, a developer will build that line several hundred feet to get to his property and I'll go past several undeveloped properties that receive a benefit from that wastewater line because it can serve our minimum size can, uh, can still serve quite a few properties. The minimum size is mostly based upon maintenance needs. So that, that creates an opportunity, or a zone of benefit would create an opportunity for that developer to um, recover some of those costs from other properties that uh, benefit from that improvement. And so it's, it's, and it's really about providing an opportunity, not a guarantee. So a lot of several communities around Oregon, or many communities have uh, an ordinance of this type on their books, including Springfield and Corvallis, uh, Tigert, Lake Oswego, uh, Medford. And it's really about providing an opportunity for developers. So if, they, if, um, if, they're, if, uh, if it might provide a more um, opportunity to develop a parcel if it's a small project with high infrastructure costs, and they typically have a life expectancy, you know, 10 to 20 years where Property owners that take advantage of that benefit um, 
pay the city and then the city remits that money to the developer that actually built the improvement in the in the first place. And then the second um, proposed amendment to the code deals with uh, equivalent assessments for street improvements. So um, in our code, uh, new developers are required to build the street system to serve their developments. Some of those streets are internal to the development. Some of them are, are um, related to unimproved streets that are adjacent to the development. And our priority is to, to have the streets constructed to urban standards um, but sometimes that's not practical. If it's a long, unimproved arterial collector street and the development is a short stretch of that and is required to build a half street improvement, it, uh, technically it's very difficult to build a short section of a half street in a long section of unimproved street. So in those instances, um, the developer is required to pay an equivalent assessment. In our code, um, uh, provides the methodology that we determine those equivalent assessments at, and it's based upon the scope of the overall street improvement for that arterial collector, and then determining how many parcels um, will benefit that from that, and the number of parcels, of course, is the denominator in that calculation, but, um, but those, the assumptions made for those two variables can greatly affect the magnitude of the equivalent assessment a particular developer will pay. And in some cases, um, that equivalent assessment using our methodology in the code uh, can exceed by an order of magnitude the actual frontage cost if the developer was able to build the, the street improvements in front of their property. So, the, so this amendment would allow or would limit the amount of the equivalent assessment to be no more than the estimated cost of the frontage improvements of any particular development. Um, and so, so prior to uh, moving forward with either of these amendments, we would uh, develop a public outreach plan and we'd, and we'd reach out to stakeholders such as the Home Builders, Neighborhood Leadership Council, the Chamber of Commerce, um, either the Planning Commission or the Technical Resource Group from Envision Eugene, which is which is sunsetted, but that group is still, um, we'd probably pull that group together since they've had a lot of interest in this type of thing in terms of how to, how to um, uh, move forward with implementing Envision Eugene. So we'd, and some of the things we'd look at is uh, for the zone of benefit or reimbursement district would be, well, one would be the name. Is it a zone of benefit or is it a reimbursement district? Um, another would be what are, what are the things that we've learned from other communities that have implemented this type of ordinance? Um, how long should that uh, zone of benefit or reimbursement last? Is it 10 years or 20 years? Uh, and what type of improvements would be eligible? So those types of things would be what we try to, to glean from these different stakeholders groups. And then on the, on the um, equivalent assessment, it's really is what's, what's a fair um, amount for an equivalent assessment for a private development project? what's equitable and what's uh, implementable from a staff standpoint so that it's, so we're not, we're not spending um, an incredible amount of time developing cost estimates and trying to figure out how parcels are gonna subdivide and, and how many parcels are gonna be part of that calculation. And then um, from that stakeholder input, then the idea would be come back with a second work session and a draft ordinance uh, to the city council with what we've heard from the community and the stakeholders, and um, and then moving forward with a, a public hearing and action by the council to change those two sections of Chapter Seven. So that's uh, the overview I have for today. I'd be happy to answer questions. I have Mike and George polling in the queue, but before I call on them, I wanted to ask you. I'm sure you have, but it would be um, informative to us to hear what the experience of those other communities who are doing this already has been, and what are the what are the things that have worked well and what are the things that have not worked as well so that we can learn from those two? And I, I'm assuming you've probably done some of that, but I just think it would be good to share it with us. All right, Mike. Thank you, Mayor, and I echo her comments. <clears throat> A couple years ago, we revised the LID and assessment process. <clears throat> and I suppose created kind of this zone of benefit idea with, with regard to streets where if a cul-de-sac is off there of, a, of an arterial that's going to be brought to a city standard, they don't have frontage the same way someone along there does, but they share in the cost, right? Right. So 
would you characterize this as working in the other direction, perhaps, of taking some, if somebody's doing a, a construction of a, a neighborhood, a series of, of housing development that connects to an, un, uh, an unimproved arterial, um, would the effect be that they would contribute less to that when it was developed or brought to a city standard? Um, no, the goal is the goal has always been for everyone to pay their equitable share. So, um, <laughs> so, but the 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 trick is determining what that is without knowing what the future scope of the project is going to be and how many parcels are going to um, uh, be there at the time of the development. Particularly if there's a lot of large vacant lots that could subdivide. But I don't I don't see it counter to that it's um, I think it's uh, congruent with that it's just um, but it's always going to be an issue of, of of trying to make it equitable but when we get to that assessment project making sure that we have uh, sufficient funds to build the project and in, in the, for example in the case of um, when we did the Maple Elmira assessment project several years ago we had several properties that had paid equivalent assessments and and we had overestimated so they um, so they actually got money back when the final assessments were due so it's the developer or the property owner the property owner in the, I want to ask in a specific so is, is it true that when we have new development occur in a division in a, in a subdivision in an area where the streets are required at development to be at a city standard, but they connect through a substandard or an unimproved arterial. Um, do we collect any money from the developer at the time of development towards the future um, development to a city standard of that arterial? We do on arterials and collectors, but we don't on local streets. And that's a numbers game, right? I mean, that's determined by the number of the, the traffic count on the arterial? Uh, no, it's to it's determined by classification. Uh, the, the classification of the street, um, what the estimated cost of that future improvement to that street is, and then the number of parcels that would benefit from that improvement. So it would be the parcels fronting that improvement, and then as you mentioned, the, you know, if there was a cul-de-sac off that arterial collector, it would be those properties on the cul-de-sac. This is only tangential, but it's, okay. it's a big issue in my ward, so I want to ask about it while we're talking around this issue. Um, you're familiar with Gillum, north of Ayers, yes? Yes. Okay. That's a horror show of a road <laughs> with, you know, three-foot deep uh, swales that are you know, within a foot or two of the roadway itself on either side. So there's no way to walk on that roadside without being in the lane with a stroller or anything else. And... That's the only access point, the only road for dozens and dozens and dozens of homes north of that, mm -hmm. many of whom have streets developed to a city standard. So my question, when, our, when Gillum North of ours is, to, is, is brought to a city standard at some point, <clears throat> will all of those homes, Mirror Pond, all of the, you know, everything north of ours on, be assessed as a zone of benefit? Uh, no, so the zone of benefit... So the assessment district is a different um, concept than the zone of benefit. The assessment district is something that the city creates, and we fund the public improvement. And through the LID. Through the local improvement district, right. Yeah. And, and north of Ayers, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of properties on Gillum Road that, um, and some cul-de-sacs that only have access via Gillum Road. Everything north of Ayers only has access. You know, there's Gillum. some that... that loop around and can come back to Ayers Road without traveling Gillum Road. But, but regardless, whoever, whoever only has access to their property by going on Gillum Road would mm -hmm. be included in a city local improvement district. And we've done local improvement districts that have included county properties with the Board of Commissioners positions. We did that on Garden Way. We did that, I think, on Ayers Road years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the Zone mm -hmm. of Benefit or Reimbursement District is where a, a developer yeah. Builds the improvement to serve his development, but provides additional capacity and it's an opportunity for him to recover some of that cost from properties that would benefit from that capacity. Thank you. George Poling. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to ask uh, 
with the same information that the mayor asked for, some kind of side-by-side -side comparison of some of the ordinances uh, mm -hmm. in the other cities, as well as, and I don't know if you can do this, the financial impact on the SDC funds and how that may or may not impact future uh, projects that we have uh, waiting to be completed. Betty? Oh, thank you. That was fast. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask who, who asked for this change? Well, um, the, um, the equivalent assessment one is, uh, I mean, personally, I would want that because my staff are the one that have to explain to a developer why they have to pay uh, something much greater in cost than what their would if they built the improvement. So, I mean, that one was staff initiated. Um, a community I worked for 14 years ago, Lake Oswego, um, during my employment, we created this zone of benefit. So I had experience there. And I know and we've had these conversations on and off for many years, but, uh, but also recently talking with the planning folks and the goals of an Envision Eugene, it just, uh, the, the time seemed right. So, um, so I guess you could say Public Works is bringing these two proposals forward. And thank you. And something, I, it may be similar to what Mike was asking, but a related matter. I remember when this, not in my ward at all, but another north, somewhere north, um, huge development was built of new houses. And because of that development, a, a street, an unimproved street, then had needed to be improved. And the people who lived had lived on that street for many years had to be, had to help pay for it, which, and the expense was caused by the new development. And is there any way to, as far as I know, the developer did not have to help pay for the improvements to that street. It was people who lived there for 30, 40 years who really couldn't afford the assessment. Is there any, a uh, thing that will change that, or is that, am I correct that that's what happened? Um, I'm, I'm not, uh, under the current code, that, that situation doesn't occur because to, it requires a council action to form an assessment district to assess private properties. If a developer is required as a land use condition to build a public improvement, um, he's solely responsible for that cost of that public improvement. Uh, th this change would, but the new development didn't need the, the developer put in the good streets, but but this caused the old street to need to be improved because it was the only access. Okay. Well, then it, then that would have required council action to um, form that local improvement district that would assess uh, properties for that improvement. I think we did that. I think it was wrong. But oh, okay. But but I wonder if there's if you're thinking of of changing that in some way. I think it's a related matter. We did change the cul-de-sac thing right. with our latest change, but this, I, if that came up again, that was really unjust to the people who lived on the old road. That's all, thank you. Mike? Thank you, Mayor. I've been asking Kurt, I know this is one of those lower priority things, probably with all of the work we've done in the last few years to make our roads better. But I've been asking for a really long time for a comprehensive plan for our unimproved streets. And I know they've started to do some work on that. Okay? I still am hopeful that one day we'll have a comprehensive plan for how we deal with the unimproved county roads that we've brought in. And that's why I asked the question I did the other night when we did the annexation on the Monday night meeting, because that's something we continue to do, is to annex in unimproved county roads without a plan for how we're going to bring them to a city standard. So I'm wondering if we can't have a work session at some point or talk about a policy change that would as we develop an entire new area that relies entirely, as in the case in Gillum, relies entirely on an unimproved county road as its only access point, and now we're going to we're going to we're going to, you know, assess only those folks who live on that road for the improvement. I've always argued that if you live on a road, you should be the one to pay for it. That's fair, but when the city's action creates an 
a, a great deal more traffic by that what used to be old country road house, then I think there's a different level of responsibility to, to, from both the folks who develop it and the folks who are going to live in those new houses and frankly from the city from us planning to put those houses there. So I'd like to see us talking about at least some manner of ordinance change that allows those folks like on North Gillum to get some kind of a break because they're not the ones that created a whole housing development you know that could only get get with folks who could only get there by means of traveling down their road and and pushing it towards the need for city standard so much more quickly and i think maybe a part of that would be that we have an automatic policy that says if you're going to put a development in in such a way the city has to have whether there's been an lid created by means of the neighbors or not the city has a duty to improve that access road um, to a city standard. So I, I don't know whether that's going to require. Uh, I'd say do a work. Get that. I'd, I'd say that. It, ask for a work I session. guess I'm asking ask Beth then. Can we have a poll, please, for a work session on how to deal with unimproved roads, specifically those that go towards new housing development areas? Thank you. And Chris. Yeah, and, and I would definitely support that because I think it's a very legitimate question and it, and it gets to a larger. Um, probably even a larger question, which is uh, what is the city's um, policy and uh, intentions around growth? Because a lot of the questions I get are from people who live in the, uh, in the boundary between the city limits and the urban growth boundary. And right now there is a, a, a large amount of, I would say misinformation and confusion about what can and cannot happen in that zone. Um, and I think unimproved streets is one piece of it, but I think there's a number of questions uh, and um, I think it would be good to have a work session on unimproved streets and I don't know whether you, we might be interested in maybe having a little bit of an expanded conversation about what are the implications of growth. We know growth is going to occur and it would be great if we could be more intentional and clear uh, about what the city thinks will happen with that growth because as it occurs I don't want to create a lot of confusion so that people get resentful and angry later on and so to get ahead of that conversation I think would be helpful for me um, I have um, a comprehensive plan I, I have a lot of people who ask questions about unimproved streets and I give them the answer that this is the way we've done it for a hundred years and it's never a satisfactory answer even though it is the traditional answer but I don't have a better answer for them because um, it's a significant amount of money and there's a significant amount of unimproved streets even within the city limits. And so I know we've gotten kind of a field from this conversation, but what, what it has done is this has touched um, a nerve that many of us have, have felt uh, because of comments we get from, from members of the community. So I do think it's a conversation worth having and, and figure out how we can be more clear and intentional um, around unimproved streets and development within those zones. What, what, what will happen or what do we anticipate happening uh, would be helpful for me too. So this fits into something I brought up a number of times and for a number of different issues is that I think it helps me and helps the public if the council tells people where they're ha what they intend to do, where they're aiming for. It doesn't mean you get all the way there um, in the near future, yeah. but at least you let people know that actually we do have an intention that all those streets will get improved and here's how we're going to move in that direction. And I think that can be said about many things we're working on. You know, you know, you can't take the whole bite at one time, but at least you let people know that that's what you intend. That's to do. the goal out there. Right. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Anybody else has any more thoughts on that? I'm sure you'll be glad to hear from them. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next up uh, is the Downtown High Speed Fiber Project update. Thank you, Mayor. And I'll turn over to Ann to and get us started. With that okay. yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, we're here today to talk about the Downtown High Speed Fiber Project. Staff are preparing a federal grant application to secure additional funding for the project, and we brought it to the Intergovernmental Relations Committee, the IGR, for approval earlier this month. Uh, 
and Councillor Taylor indicated it was a large request and it was worthy of public discussion. And in response to that request, this item was placed on the Council's work session agenda for today. And I'm here with Pavel Gubanikin, Central Services Department Finance Manager, and I'm Ann Fifield, Economic Development Planner in the Community Development Division. Um, we have two main objectives for today's work session. One is to provide a very high level update on the status of the downtown fiber project. And the second is to seek council's authorization for submittal of the federal grant application for the project. Um, and the mayor and I attended a meeting this summer with some, uh, Chris was there Touch with the, fiber. yeah, yeah, we're all <laughs> playing, we've we got help. our toys. <laughs> It was a good meeting with folks from EWEB and other groups. It's a so I want to give a brief overview on the problem that this project is addressing. There's limited telecommunications infrastructure in Eugene. There's a lack of competition leading to lower service levels and higher prices than is seen in larger markets. This is typical of mid-sized and smaller communities. Major metropolitan areas are more likely to have many private providers simply because they are larger markets. The limited telecommunications infrastructure has become a factor that's limiting the economic prosperity for our community. The lower service speeds and higher prices make it difficult for firms that depend on internet communications to thrive. Quality internet access has become essential transportation infrastructure as more and more goods and services are being transported electronically. Firms that transfer large amounts of data are unlikely to stay and grow here. To address the problem, the city partnered with EWEB and ELCOG to test the technical and market feasibility of a municipally owned network on, in a pilot project, we determined it is feasible to run fiber cables through EWEB's elec underground electric conduit in the downtown. The network connects individual buildings to LCOG's Willamette Internet Exchange, the WICS, to create a high-speed fiber network. The method allows us to build such a network without having to trench the streets. Using the electrical conduit greatly reduces out-of-pocket costs and the cost to businesses of having streets closed. LCOG's Internet Exchange at Point provides an already existing connection hub from Eugene to a major internet hub in Portland. Local tech firms are growing. I recently spoke with a firm that's outgrown their current office space and they're looking for something bigger to accommodate their growing staff. They are only looking at locations that are served by the fiber network. The network's gonna provide them the infrastructure they need to continue to grow and be competitive on the global market. This image on the screen shows a recent tech crawl event that was organized by the Technology Association of Oregon, an important partner on our fiber project. And the event was attended by a lot of people, up to a thousand people participated, just under a thousand people. There was a lot of optimism at the event and some of that optimism comes from expectations about the planned fiber network. That, was that at Kesey Square? That's at Kesey Square, yes. Probably. <laughs> the map on this, the screen right now shows the boundary of the planned fiber service area. The blue shaded area shows where the network will be built using eWeb's underground electric conduit. The black diagonal lines show the downtown urban renewal district and the pink horizontal lines show the riverfront urban renewal district. We've estimated that the total cost of the project is $4 million. The urban renewal agency amended the downtown urban renewal plan last June to allow the downtown urban renewal district to fund up to $3 million for the fiber project. Based on engineering estimates, we expect the costs inside that district to be about $2 million, but we've got some wiggle room. As discussed during the council's urban renewal conversations earlier this year, the downtown high-speed fiber project as currently scoped has a funding gap due to approximately half of the proposed fiber service area lying outside the downtown and riverfront urban renewal districts. The fiber project has two separate but complementary components. The first is the fiber network. That's the connections from individual buildings to the Willamette Internet Exchange, the WICS. The other component is what we've called the middle mile. And under current conditions, what the middle mile addresses is how under current conditions, individual internet service providers have to purchase a connection from our WICS hub to larger internet hubs up in Portland or other communities. 
our planning team determined that we could purchase a large connection at something that's akin to a wholesale rate. The individual service providers right now are paying for connections that are more of a retail rate. And we determined that the WICs could purchase a large connection and resale segments just at above cost to the ISPs at a much lower rate. And we've called that connection the middle mile. Not only does it lower service rates, it expands capacity. The fiber network that we're building will establish many individual connections into the WICs, allowing gigabit service. However, the existing capacity from the WICs up to larger internet hubs will not be able to accommodate all of that new infrastructure. We're, we will create a bottleneck coming out of the WICs to the rest of the internet. And so the middle mile not only will lower service costs, it actually expands capacity. So we actually will be able to provide gigabit speeds. Um, the, uh, at the bottom of the slide, we show a timeline. We expect that the middle mile component of the project can be put in place this winter. The fiber network construction will take longer. We expect it to, it'll be built in stages. We're, we intend to start in the southeast quadrant where the, the Wix is sort of the centroid of the whole project. So we'll start south of Broadway and east of Willamette, and then we'll move west from there and north from there. We expect to begin this winter, and it should be able to finish up by next winter. The timeline is tentative and subject to change. Based, It's a construction project, and we'll find other things that will, that will affect it. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Pavel, who will discuss the funding element. Thanks, Sam. Uh, as Anne indicated, the downtown high-speed fiber project, as currently defined, has a substantial funding gap due to the fact that the urban renewal funds may not be used outside of the two urban renewal districts. As shown on the slide, the funding sources for this project that have been identified so far total approximately $2.4 million, with the remaining $1.6 million of the $4 million being unfunded. There are federal and state funding opportunities that are available to either close or substantially reduce this funding gap. The two primary funding opportunities uh, that have been identified by the city staff are the federal grant with the Economic Development Administration that I will talk about specifically in a moment, and the state grant through the Infrastructure Finance Authority, uh, which is a state uh, program uh, that we may potentially pursue in the future if we're not successful in trying to secure federal funding. Uh, another potential source that may be used uh, to reduce this funding gap is the telecommunications fund. Uh, it is expected that the telecom fund may be able to contribute up to a million dollars towards this project, but is not likely to have sufficient resources to close the entire $1.6 million funding gap. Uh, and uh, obviously, if we are unable to close this funding gap, there will be two basic options available with one to reduce the scope of the project, most likely by shrinking the fiber service area that's outside of the two urban renewal district, or the second option would be to seek other funding sources to close that funding gap. Uh, the staff believe that it is prudent to seek external grant funding sources to either reduce or close the funding gap that currently exists for a number of reasons. Uh, well, the obvious one is that it will allow us to maximize the fiber service area and thus maximize the economic development impact of this project on downtown prosperity. Uh, it will also allow us to leverage the uh, urban renewal funds and the value of eWeb's underground electrical conduit and get additional funding uh, by leveraging those funds. And also allow us to uh, reduce the impact on other city funds, such as potentially the telecommunications fund, uh, in order to close this funding gap. Uh, a detailed funding plan for this project will be brought to the council later this fiscal year via the supplemental budget process. And I will sp speak more to that in a moment. Uh, this slide shows uh, some specifics about the Economic Development Administration grant uh, on which you are being asked to make a decision today. Uh, a few words about this uh, grant funding opportunity. Uh, this, is, um, this grant funding is through the Investments for Public Works and Economic Adjustment Assistance Program, uh, which is a program available nationally uh, to make strategic investments in economic development projects. 
Uh, the total grant application amount is a little bit over $2 million. However, the grant award may be less than that. Uh, historically, the grant awards under this particular grant program have ranged between $200,000 and $3 million, with the median being about $1.4 million. Uh, so we're hopeful that if the Council authorizes this grant application and if we're successful in pursuing that, um, we will likely be able to close a if not all, the substantial part of the funding gap. Uh, this grant does require a local match of 50%. Uh, the local match for this grant will consist of two parts. One is the downtown urban renewal funding that has previously been authorized by the council and will be brought to you as part of the supplemental budget number one for appropriation uh, because those appropriations were not included in the FY17 adopted budget. Uh, the second part of the local mesh is the value of eWeb's underground electrical conduit. That's an essential part of the project that allows us to do it relatively cheaply uh, by not uh, tearing up the streets. Uh, following the council's uh, direction or decision to uh, renew the uh, downtown urban renewal uh, plan uh, back in June, the staff from the City of Eugene, EWEB, and Alcock have been working with the Economic Development Administration uh, to submit a grant pre-application to see if we would even qualify for this funding, and that was done in early July. Uh, in mid-August, uh, we were notified by the EDA uh, that we are invited to submit a full grant application, and at that time, uh, the staff from the three, three um, entities started working on assembling the grant full grant application. Uh, the city staff were advised uh, by the Economic Development Administration that uh, the decision um, on this grant uh, would be made within 60 days of the grant application, which is due on October 11th. And I do want to note that it is likely that you will not see this grant on supplemental budget number one because of the timing of the grant award. We're probably not going to know until December at the earliest if we're awarded it if the council authorizes the grant application. So what will likely happen if we are successful in pursuing this funding opportunity is that it will be brought to you for appropriation uh, at a later supplemental budget uh, later in the fiscal year. Uh, I also do want to note that this is a joint grant application with the City of Eugene as the lead applicant and EWEB and Alcock as co-applicants. Um, and the city staff have been uh, working very closely with the staff from those two entities to assemble uh, the best grant application that we can put forward and build a strong business case with the feds for this project. Uh, and finally, uh, these are the two options uh, that we would like to present for your consideration today, which is basically either to authorize the submittal of this grant or to not authorize the submittal. Uh, and that essentially concludes our presentation, and Anna and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Uh, Chris in the queue, and, and Mike and George. Thank you. Um, we talked about this at the Elcock meeting last week, and um, for the uh, 32 other government and agency partners, there's a great deal of enthusiasm for this project. Um, and, I, and, and rather than think of this as one big, giant project, um, I think it's more valuable to think of it as a combination of, of a lot of smaller projects. And one of the benefits of that is it's much easier to track where the money goes so that each chunk of money gets spent appropriately for the right part of this project and isn't spent inappropriately. Um, so that, you know, well, City of Eugene money is going to pay for broadband in Oak Ridge um, doesn't really happen because of the way this is structured. I, it's structured very effectively to ensure that each piece of the funding goes in the right way, which is why you have the gap in the first place. Nobody's moving money inappropriately. And I, I think that's very important to know that. Um, Eugene is paying for an incredible level of service within Eugene, but that also helps some of these other strung together pieces to benefit. Um, another one is, is this money going to pay for technology that is current, appropriate, and, and, and right size, the right thing. And um, Milo Meacham, who you know from Elcott, who's been shepherding this project for a while, uh, has done a lot of homework and talked to a lot of providers in terms of the technology we're offering. And uh, he assures us that this is state-of-the-art technology. 
um, and that we're not putting in something that, you know, you put this in and then five years from now you have to completely tear it out and put something else in because technology does change. But in this case, we're putting in the most advanced technology available. Um, and I think that's a great thing because there's no point in building a great driveway and then as soon as you pull out of your driveway, you're on a dirt road. So the connectivity needs to go all the way up the line, and I think we're, we're very careful to make sure that happens. And that's where what we're doing to help us can benefit all the, the other beads on this string, and I think that's, that's a great thing. And I'll just give you one example of what the potential is. Uh, right now, the city of Westfur, you know where that is. I mean, that's way down Highway 58, basically has no Internet at all. They had some DSL, and it was very slow and very difficult. Through the benefit of all these strung together pieces, one of the pilot projects will be to provide Westfer with high speed wireless internet that actually for a relatively small investment of money will make the city of Westfer the most technologically advanced internet hub in the Lane County. All 17 houses. All 17 houses or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. But it's just to show that as a test case, we can, we can have state of the art technology for a relatively low cost by the way we're doing this. So it's just really exciting. Um, and so for me, it's not only appropriate from the standpoint of how the money is spent and what the projects are, but it's also appropriate for the technology we're investing. And so I think to, to submit this grant uh, is really a very, very good idea. Mike. Thank you. Does Greg have the motion for this? Yes, he does. Okay. Um, I have to say, I actually think it's bigger than even the wonderful things that my colleague has just said. I think it's much bigger than that. Um, I'm happy to vote in favor of this grant application. I think this is maybe one of the most important um, infrastructure projects the city has taken on in years, in years. Um, I think that's easily provable. The the successful American cities of the 16th and 1700s were located along rivers and harbors and waterways where their goods and services could be transported to other places. And in the 1800s, it was along railroads and in the 1950s, along the interstate highways. And the cities that weren't connected to those transportation infrastructures suffered. This is the transportation corridor of tomorrow and it's here today. And we have a chance to put ourselves ahead of the curve in, in that capability and to jumpstart and to continue to see the increase from companies that are starting to develop in our downtown. And this is nece necessary infrastructure for them. There's a company in our downtown, for example, that was written up in the Oregon Business Journal the other day because they work in a thing called the Internet of Things, which is massive quantities of data collected from devices and from things. And they developed a, a program that can show you, and this is online, you can see it on YouTube and all this sort of thing. But it'll show you where every TriMet bus all throughout the three counties in Portland is at any given moment. And where it's been at any given moment in the past since they started the system all laid out on maps so that the folks at TriMet can do a much better job of efficiently making sure that their transportation system works and their public transportation. Just those simple kinds of tools we built here in downtown Eugene with local companies. And the future is so much more. Those large scale data pieces are necessary in order to be able to do that kind of work and to grow those kind of businesses in our community. And so again, I'm absolutely in favor and I think it's one of the most important infrastructure uh, pieces that we've worked on in, in years. George Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, how much is that currently in the telecom? Telecom fund. As far as the we win a big settlement and eighteen million dollars went in. The eighteen million dollars actually won't go into the telecom fund. It hasn't been appropriated at all by the council yet. It will just show up as part of a general fund reserve, uh, and uh, during a budget process or any other time, you can appropriate those dollars. I'm just wondering why that couldn't. Okay. Contribution be bigger, I guess. Um, why? Why it was just kind of, you know, up to a million dollars. Um, all right. So, so just up above that in the funding summary, it says private contributions of a hundred thousand dollars. 
Well, what's that mean exactly? Are those fees that each property owner will pay, or are they like a donation from the property owners? This is a concept that is still being worked on by the project team. Uh, with project, private contributions may potentially apply to, uh, we are being approached by downtown businesses who are willing to, to give money to the city to, in order to get connected to the network faster. Well, so yeah. what likely will be done as part of this project's implementation is um, to have, you know, some kind of a, you know, input from businesses to kind of ascertain their willingness, uh, you know, to pay to connect early to see if that's an additional resource that may be leveraged for the project. Uh, no decision has been made as to the amount or how it will be structured. That's something that will need to be worked out. Well. Uh, and how many properties will be, um, remind us again, how many properties? Uh, 128 be? buildings, I believe, is it's within the The estimate service area. is roughly 100, around 120 buildings. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> this seems like an enormous giveaway in, in a way. I mean, I, I'm, I, don't get me wrong, I'm for the project. I think it's, it's most worthy. But I, I think that um, with public funds, we're giving an enormous benefit to the property owners downtown. I mean, that's less than $1,000 to hook up for per building. And, um, you know, it's, it's like one fortieth of the cost of the whole project. I think that should be a lot higher, and I think it should be ascertained. I mean, you, you, you I think, because, see, if you're across the street, you're not going to get that. And, you, and the, your competitors across the street, and there, there will be people in, that could benefit from the, the high speed, they will not, they're not going to see it for you, perhaps years, and then their competitors across the street will have it. And of course, it's just an enormous benefit to the owner of the property um, because they'll be able to charge premium rents. And um, I think that that really needs to be looked at. And I think they need you need to take this hundred thousand dollar figure and bump that way way up because it's otherwise it's just like why even charge him? It's it's an enormous gift. It's an enormous benefit. So, um, I mean, I may go ahead and support this, but but I it, it it's kind of a work in progress, and I realize there's deadlines for the grant application and all that. But this project funding summary, I think, really should be fleshed out a lot, a lot more. We, we intend to work with a number of commercial brokers and property managers to identify an appropriate hookup fee. We didn't want to overestimate that amount for budgeting purposes. The $100,000 is a conservative estimate, but we, we don't know how much we'll get be able to, to pull in from the private property owners. So it's, it's a negotiation with, between the city and the private property owners? It, it, we just haven't determined the methodology to estimate that hookup fee, yeah. Well, I'll tell you right now, that's, that's way too low, I mean, for, 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 mm -hmm. this, for this benefit. So whichever one agrees is, is it's just enormous. And so um, I'd like to see that figure go way, way up. Eddie, you're next. Thank you. And then, I, and then uh, you'll put it on the table. Uh, I agree with George that the fee is too low. I, I asked to have this brought up because, well, two reasons, I guess. Um, I really think, I think we should discuss it in public. I think that we should aim to have every property in the city hooked up. And it is unfair to give a big subsidy to a few. And I asked to have it discussed because, not because I'm against asking for a grant, but this is a big amount of money. And it's one of the objections I have to urban renewal, only one of them, is that it's too easy to spend the money out of public view. And since this is such a big amount, I thought that the public should know we should do it in public if we're going to ask for it. It isn't just that we're asking for money, we're committing money, and it's a big amount. And even though it comes from urban renewal, that's public money, it's tax money. And that money is not free, contrary to what some people seem to believe. Um, and that's that's all. I just I wanted to wanted us to vote in public and discuss it in public if we're going to do it. Thank you. 
Put it on the table, please. Okay. I move to authorize the submittal of the grant application to the EDA for funds to construct a public owned fiber network in the downtown. Thank you. Um, second. Moved and seconded, and I have Mike and then Chris in the queue. Thank you. I know that we're going to do this. Well, let me ask this question first. When do you anticipate funds from the Comcast suit, uh, us taking possession of those funds? Uh, we received a check last week, and so it's deposited in our we have it. Okay. account. So this is a, obviously then going to be a process of either the, you know, a work session where we talk about it, or a process of the the uh, budgeting adjustments in December, or maybe even budgeting next spring. But I have to say, I, this is the second meeting in a row. I, I agree with Betty. Um, this this is such an important piece of infrastructure that it should be, and I know it's being planned to be someday, more widely distributed than in just the downtown core of our city. Um, I believe it should be community-wide. I believe we should use the money from Comcast to do it because there's a nexus in it in its existence in the first place, in my opinion. And uh, I'd like to see us planning for at least some of that money to be used to, to widen the footprint of this as quickly as we can. So just wanted to put that out there so that we're starting to think about that in a little bit in advance. Before I turn to Chris, I just want to say I, I very much think, uh, agree with what you said, and I very much think the public wants to know that we're heading in that direction and in and sort of written and stated intentionality by this council i think is important for the community to to really know that we intend for everybody uh, over time to be able to have access so that's um chris you're next yeah i was just going to say the same thing part of the conversation has been um and why presented this as a whole series of different interconnected um, projects is one of them is exactly that. In fact, um, there's already discussions underway for how we take this initial infrastructure and relatively soon, so we're not talking years and years and years from now, relatively soon uh, to build that into the ability to provide high-speed wireless internet access to every single house in Eugene for a very affordable cost. And so it's not like, yeah, we'll get around to that. There's actually discussion about how to do that as quickly as possible. It, it is worthwhile to have the conversation about some of the funding. Um, maybe there is some flexibility in that to make it happen sooner or later. I don't know. Um, but it is very much part of the intention for this project from the beginning that its ultimate um, relatively soon result will be uh, for every single person in Eugene to have access to this technology and to be able to do it uh, wirelessly. So, as I say over and over again, for me, this is all about the, our families doing better, and that's why I care about the the uh, economic development in our downtown and this kind of infrastructure being put in into place, and that and that extends out to our neighborhoods and everyone else. So, but I do think, um, again, I will say that people. There's a tension in our community that some folks think anything you do for business is only for business and not for the, for the rest of us. And, uh, and that's just, we all know that. And so what I, I think this, if we are very intentional about what we, where we're planning on moving, I think that can help the conversation in, in both ways. And I think we need to be, to do that and not just say, yeah, we, we think that, but it never kind of works its way into our, our documents or anything like that. So I, I think that letting the public know that, that, that you've got them in your line of eye, your eye line is really, um, really an important part of getting their support for the work that we're doing right now. I think we're ready to vote on this. All those in favor, please indicate. One, two, four, five, six, and none in opposition. It passes. Thank you. And with that, we're done for the business of today.